Welcome to the Tobacco Online Policy Seminar Tops. Thank you for joining us today. I'm Mariana Garzenbrut, your guest MC today, a tobacco control researcher at the Universidad de la República in Uruguay. TOPS is being organized by Catherine McLean from Temple University, C. Shang from the Ohio State University, Mike Pesco from, from Georgia State University, and Justin White from the University of California, San Francisco. The seminar will be one hour with questions asked by the moderator and discussion. The audience may post questions and comments in the Q&A panel, and the moderator will draw from these questions and comments in conversation with the presenter. Please review the guidelines on tobaccopolicy.org for acceptable comments. Please keep the comments professional and related to the research being discussed. Comments meeting seminar series guidelines will be shared with the presenter afterwards, even, even if they are not read aloud. Your comments are very much appreciated. The presentation is being video recorded and will be made available on the TOPS website, tobaccopolicy.org. I will turn the presentation over to today's moderator, Justin White from the University of California, San Francisco, to introduce our speaker. Justin. Today, Dr. Kimberly Sterling will lead a Grand Rounds presentation entitled The Measurement of Little Cigar and Cigarillo Use and the Assessment of Tobacco Regulatory Policies Using Discrete Choice Experiments. Dr. Sterling is an Associate Professor of Health Promotion and Behavioral Sciences at the University of Texas School of Public Health. She's a tobacco, uh, she has expertise in youth and young adult cigarette and novel tobacco product use, tobacco related health disparities and smoking cessation. Her research funded by the FDA and NIH has informed federal tobacco control policies, specifically the FDA's expansion of its regulatory authority to cigars. Si Shang is co-author of one of the papers Dr. Sterling will present and Si will assist in answering select questions in the Q&A. Our discussant today is Catherine McLean from Temple University. Dr. Sterling will be presenting her re research in two segments. We'll have a pause after each segment to allow for questions. Dr. Sterling, thank you for presenting for us today. Thank you so much, Justin. Um, thank you all for the invitation. And I will go ahead and share my slides and we'll get started. So once again, thanks everyone for joining us today. Um, as Justin has already mentioned, I'm Kim Sterling. I'm an Associate Professor of Health Promotion and Behavioral Sciences at the University of Texas School of Public Health. And I am a Little Cigar and Cigarillo uh, researcher. And today what I'd like to do is to present some findings to you all from two studies that I have been a part of. Um, as Justin has already mentioned, one of these studies will center around using discrete choice experiments um, to help us understand how little cigars and cigarillo product advertisements appeal to young adults. Um, and the second study will, will take a slightly different focus and will um, present some findings from some ongoing survey research that we are doing right now um, to highlight how complex the patterns of little cigar and cigarillo product use are among diverse samples of young adults. Um, before I begin with the presentation, um, you can see that my following disclosures are on the slide. The studies that will be presented to you all today have been funded by, um, by NIDA and by NCI um, in collaboration with the Food and Drug Administration. So before I begin talking about the specifics of each study, I'd like to introduce you all to a conceptual model that has really guided my research. And this conceptual model is the behavioral ep epidemiological framework that was developed by Salas and colleagues. And as you can see here on the slide, this framework consists of five phases of research that specify a systematic sequence of studies on health-related behaviors that could and should eventually lead to evidence-based interventions. You can see that there's a linear sequence to these phases where one builds upon the other. But there's some really important feedback and feed-forward links inherent in the model as well. And today, I'm gonna present findings from two studies, with the first study representing studies that would typically be found or categorized under phase three research. And the second study that I'm going to present to you all today would be categorized under phase two research. At the end of the talk, today we'll discuss how 
each of the studies um, and how each of the, the phases can directly impact tobacco regulatory policy. So for those of you who may be unfamiliar with these products, little filtered cigars and cigarillos are combustible tobacco products that are inhaled like cigarettes and are similar to cigarettes in their size, shape, filtering, and tobacco, tobacco pH. Some common brand names of these products would be Black and Miles, Swisher Sweets, White Owls, Philly Blunts, but of course there are others. And I've included an image of these products on the slide so you all can see what they look like. So although we know that little filtered cigars and cigarillos, which I will refer to throughout this presentation as LCCs, we know that these products are now deemed under the FDA's authority. Although they are deemed, we know that they have fewer regulations imposed by the FDA than cigarettes. For instance, cigarettes have a minimum pack size requirement, and they also have advertising restrictions. And these restrictions are not necessarily applied to little filtered cigars and cigarillos. We know that both cigarettes and little filtered cigars and cigarillos have flavored varieties. Currently, there are some cigarettes available on the market that are mentholated. And we also know that little filtered cigars and cigarillos are available in a variety of flavors. Now, I'm sure you all um, have recently heard the FDA's announcement um, that it plans to propose tobacco product standards to ban menthol cigarettes or um, to ban menthol as a characterizing flavor in cigarettes and to ban all flavors, including menthol in cigars. But at the moment, these products remain on the market. The popularity of little filtered cigars and cigarillos has really grown, particularly among young adults, males, non-Hispanic Blacks, Hispanics, and those with tobacco product use experience, such as someone who may have a history of cigarette use. And we really believe that the popularity of these products can be attributed to several factors, including the cigar industry's marketing of the appealing flavors that they come in, the product's affordability, often you can find these products um, for as little as 99 cents, as well as the accessibilities of these products. They're off, you can often find them sold um, as a single stick or two for the price of one. And all of these factors make these products quite attractive to price sensitive young adults. Additionally, marijuana is often co-administered in LCC products as blunts, or also known as hollowed out products that are filled with marijuana. And the ability to use LCCs as a marijuana delivery device may be appealing to some young adults. There's also evidence that young adults perceive that LCCs in general, and specifically flavored LCCs, are less risky to smoke than other tobacco products. So in sum, the combination of, of all of these factors um, are really quite concerning to us because we believe that they may indeed promote initiation among non-tobacco users and smoking maintenance among users. So let's focus our attention on product packaging for a moment. So the features of LCC product packaging um, we know that these features might contribute to the appeal of these products among young adults, and they may indeed influence their misconceptions about the risk of using these products. Now, research has pointed to industry use of package characteristics, such as product design, like colors, images, and flavor descriptors, and tobacco quality claims, to target and appeal to specific groups and manipulate consumers' perceptions about the product's harms. Thus, we know that product packaging should be a potentially important regulatory area for the FDA's consideration. And in light of FDA's recent announcement about um, the, uh, the potential product standards, um, packaging may become, an, they may become even more important to monitor or assess if and when the FDA does issue those product standards. So the findings that I'll present today are from two research project, projects that were conducted to provide evidence to the Centers for Tobacco Products, or CTP, to address the priorities listed here on the screen. 
And the hope is that the evidence from both of these studies will provide um, information to the field about the appeal of flavors in LCCs, about the appeal of its, pack, of, of its product packaging, and also provide the field with a little bit more information about how um, these products are used among young adults. So let's jump into our first study. And in this study, we use discrete choice experiments or discrete choice experiment method to assess how young adults or to assess young adults' preferences for little cigar and cigarillo products. So what do we know so far? Well, we know that our qualitative research findings suggest that the portrayal of flavors through packaged colors, through images and descriptors found on the packages influence appeal among young adult smokers. And from a regulatory perspective, it may be important to understand whether flavored little cigar and cigarillo package features, and again, these are features such as the text, colors, pack size, and price, if these features influence young adults' tobacco choices, and specifically which feature may influence their product preference. So our qualitative findings provide us with some really useful information about respondents' actual preferences, meaning the things that they actually prefer. And their preferences are based on what they were exposed to in their environment or what they actually chose. But we know that this exposure can be restricted by a lot of factors, such as the products that might be available in their community. So as a way to complement the findings that we received from our focus group research, we decided to conduct a discrete choice experiment. And in a discrete choice experiment, our respondents were exposed to hypothetical LCC packages, which included um, package features that we selected a priority that may be of interest to, to the FDA. And the features that we chose a priority were um, flavors, text descriptors, and colors. So the key advantage of using this DCE framework is its ability to really elicit participant responses to these hypothetical flavored LCC packages that were that include these a priori features. In this particular or using this particular experiment, respondents make their choice in a control setting that avoids limitations one would experience in the real world, such as lack of availability of a particular product. So unlike lab-based experiments, DCEs use, sur use survey questions to elicit consumer preferences, and they're usually conducted as a part of an online survey. So here you can see on the slide an example of a DCE choice set, where respondents were, are shown images of hypothetical cigarillo packages that were varied with respect to flavor, flavor depiction, and that depiction occurred through text, color, or both, description of or descriptors of the LCC's um, quality, pack size, and price. Now, after respondents took a look at these hypothetical packages, they were then asked to select their preferred product. So for our study, we um, we used a convenient sample of 566 U.S. young adult cigarette smokers aged 18 to 34, and we recruited these young adults using Facebook ads. So we decided to focus on young adult cigarette smokers because these smokers have an elevated risk of LCC smoking, and we wanted to make sure that their, um, that their, their responses were included in our data. Um, so in addition to having a sample of cigarette smokers, um, we wanted to also make sure that half of these smokers were current LCC users and half of them had not used LCCs. You can also see that we oversampled for African Americans and Hispanics because these are the two particular racial ethnic groups that are at heightened risk for using these products. So on this slide, you can see the DCE attributes and levels that we tested in our particular study. 
Um, so we chose um, package attributes that were of regulatory interest. And you can see that these attributes included product flavor, flavor depiction, text quality descriptors, pack size, and price per stick. And these attributes and levels were selected based on our qualitative study findings and a review of the relevant literature. This table shows the sociodemographic characteristics and the tobacco use status in history of our study sample. And you can see here based on the slide that the, our, on average, our participants were about 28 years old. The majority were female. And we also had um, respondents who were um, majority um, non-Hispanic and white. Notably, you can see that 75% of our sample had ever smoked LCCs, even one or two puffs. And over half of the respondents in our sample currently reported using LCCs. So again, recall that our respondents were shown images of hypothetical cigarillo packages that were varied with respect to the product attributes and the levels that you just saw in the previous slide. And remember, after they were shown these hypothetical packages, the respondents were asked to select their preferred product. So we gathered our, our data, and to analyze our data, we used a mixed random parameter logit regressions to jointly analyze the effects of package attributes on the choice of LCCs after controlling for individual sociodemographic characteristics like sex, age, race, ethnicity, income, and current LCC use status. And the standard errors were clustered at the individual level since the analytical data contained repeated choices made by the same individual. So now remember, our outcome here um, is product preference. And what our data suggested was that young adults preferred grape flavor over menthol, tobacco, slash regular flavor, and sweet flavors, that they preferred to see um, a color-only depiction of flavor or a color and text depiction of flavor over just a plain text depiction of flavor. And in terms of the LCC quality descriptors, they preferred packages that had the descriptors of smooth and sweet, over satisfying. And you, we found that these results were consistent across three different regression models. So in addition to looking at, um, at the impact of flavor and flavor depiction and quality descriptors on product preference, we also looked at the impact of pack size and lower prices on respondents' product preferences. And what we found was that our findings suggested to us that these young adults preferred bigger pack sizes and lower prices. And again, we found that these results were consistent across three different regression models. So what are the important take home points from this particular study? Well, in summary, we found that our young adult cigarette smokers preferred grape flavors in LCCs. They preferred color only and color and text flavor descriptors. They preferred packages that had smooth and sweet quality descriptors. And they also preferred bigger pack sizes and lower prices. We also discovered some really important heterogeneities in young adult cigarette smokers' preferences for LCC pack sizes and flavors. Specifically, our findings suggest that although on average our sample preferred grape flavors over menthol flavors, some of them did actually prefer menthol to other flavors. And additionally, there was heterogeneity in our sample's preferences for pack size, with some preferring smaller pack sizes to larger pack sizes. So at this point, I think we should stop and entertain any questions or um, comments that you guys might have. Thanks, Kim. I think we, I, I will first see if Catherine McLean, our discussant, has any questions for you. 
Thanks so much, Kim. This is really fascinating. I do have a couple of questions. Um, in particular, I was wondering, um, were you surprised by the fact that you found that at least some of your respondents prefer larger pack sizes, uh, when I think a lot of the regulatory discussions are about uh, limiting the or setting uh, pack sizes? Do you think, how do you think about your findings with that sort of regulatory focus? Yeah, I think that certainly was a surprise to us. Um, it was something that we did not necessarily um, expect. Um, it's, you know, it's a little bit difficult to really say why those respondents might prefer these larger pack sizes and in, in, um, as it relates or instead of the smaller pack sizes. Um, it could be uh, because some of the, the larger pack sizes, for instance, you there's some brands where you can perhaps get five um, little cigars or cigarillos for maybe $2.99. Um, so perhaps some of our respondents felt that there was a better bang for their buck. Um, but yeah, we, we definitely did find that that was, that was a surprise. Great. And can you speak a little bit about your decision to use, I think you used an opt out, so the respondents could pick a product or they could pick um, the opting out. In your context, how, um, how do we think about that and what are the pros and cons? I know there's a bit of sort of thought within the literature about whether one should include the opt out or not. Yeah, and that was, so that's a great question. And as a team, we, we had a lot of you know, good discussion about that. Um, so one, you know, definitely one train of thought is to just put some packages in front of respondents and force a particular, um, force them to make a choice. Um, whereas another school of thought is to provide them with an option to opt out, um, because that would be uh, more similar to what they may see in the real world, right? So if they were to walk into a convenience store and their favorite flavor may not be on the shelf, well, then they may not necessarily buy anything else. They may choose to buy something else. So as a team, we decided to, to include this opt out um, option to more simulate what a respondent or what someone would experience in the real world. Oh, great. Thank you. Um, and did you have any interesting findings around the opt out or have you looked much about what about the decision to opt out and in, in your study? Honestly, we haven't explored that um, very much. That that is something that we certainly um, would be able to to go back and do some additional research on. But at the moment, we really haven't um, done much exploration around the opt out findings. Thank you. Uh, and first of all, just a quick clarifying question, then I'll have a follow up. I think you used hypothetical products in your in your DCE. Yes, that's correct. Yeah. Um, so I just wonder how you think about this, and I, this is not a critique of your work, I've done the same thing in my own work, but um, do you think that um, having a hypothetical product where that the respondents may recognize is not available on the market, do you think that leads to any bias from the respondents viewing the experiment as not being perhaps realistic? Again, this is yeah. an issue I've, I've dealt with too, so no, no, no critique here. Yeah, no, no, great question. And again, this was something that we sort of went around um, about in our team, in our discussions. Um, so we actually had to use uh, hypothetical packages because um, our university IRB would not allow us to use um, real packages or images of real packages for, for legal reasons. Um, and we, you know, we did have some concerns about um, just, you know, the similar concerns that you raised, would respondents not really view this as, as kind of real, right? It, it's not similar, or these aren't products that they would see um, in their local convenience stores. But we, we were pretty, um, pretty confident that um, the findings would, that they would be okay, right? For lack of a, for lack of a better way to describe it. Um, because there were, there have been other studies that have used hypothetical packaging, um, and they they produce pretty reliable results. So, although we would have preferred to use, you know, real brands or to use real packages and and perhaps manipulate some of the attributes and some of the levels that we wanted to test, unfortunately, we weren't allowed to do so. Very, very reasonable uh, answer. Uh, just one question uh, related to marijuana legalization. Uh, recreational marijuana is becoming increasingly legal across U.S. states, and you mentioned earlier uh, that these these LCCs can be used uh, as blunts. 
how yeah. do you think that the sort of the intersection of these products versus this uh, uh, wave of regulation, um, do you see, do you see any implications for policy um, in either sphere, marijuana or uh, LCCs? Yeah, um, again, great question. Um, and, it, and it's something that um, the research teams that I have worked on, um, we're really pretty concerned about it. Um, you know, we're really concerned that as marijuana, marijuana legalization increases across the country, um, you know, there's there's a pretty strong likelihood that people um, may well that certainly that cigar behavior may change, right? It may it may change in that it might decrease, it may increase. Um, um, so it, it's a, I think the question that you raise is one that is testable, right? I think the best way to get the answers to that question um, is to actually um, set up a research study where you're, where you're actually able to evaluate the impact of marijuana legalization policy on tobacco use, specifically cigar use behaviors among, among young adults um, and among anyone who's using these products. Um, but you know, without having those data in hand, it's it's kind of we're just really left to speculate what we think might happen. Um, but I am certainly, and I think my colleagues as well, we're certainly concerned about um, about marijuana legalization and how it may impact tobacco product use. Thank you so much, Kim, for your answers. So, Kim, I, I think uh, C has been quite proficient at responding to questions in the Q and A. There's still one. Um, uh, listed from Yang Yang about a uh, question about uh, whether there's a measure of nicotine dependence for LCC in traditional cigars, um, something similar to the heaviness of smoking index. Um, and uh, Yang says that the, the HIS is used for cigarettes, but obviously LCC, traditional cigars and cigarettes are, quite, are all quite different. Right. Yes. Good question. Thank you for that question. Some of my colleagues, um, Dr. Erica Trappel um, and her colleague, Dr. Sue Flocky, um, they actually were um, in the process of collecting, I believe, qualitative data um, to get a better sense of nicotine dependent symptoms and indicators among cigar users. Um, so I would, um, and I certainly can provide this citation um, for you all, um, but if um, um, if you look um, for any studies by Sue Flocky, and I believe her last name is spelled F-L-O-C-K-E, um, Sue has done some, some in-depth um, work looking at nicotine dependence among um, cigar users. Uh, with that being said, to my knowledge, I don't know of a specific nicotine dependence um, scale or measure for cigar use um, specifically. As we are out of time, thank you, Dr. Sterling, for the presentation and to the moderator and discussants. And finally, thank you to the 91 people for your participation. Thanks again for participating and have a top-notch weekend. Thank you.